Well, thank you, Brother Chairman, and good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. This morning, as our slide has accurately depicted in front of you, we're going to look, and as our Chairman has announced, at Christ the Sovereign Commander of the Angels. I suppose, in a way, it's a natural progression, isn't it, from where we got to yesterday. Remember how we considered the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ and how that he is now at the right hand of the Father, and that part of the reason for the ascension of Christ was so that he might receive privilege from his Father, status, royal honor, and authority as befits he who is the very son of the king, brought as was Mordecai and as was Joseph into the presence of the Father, that he might receive, as it were, the royal ring of authority and make writings in the king's name. And all of those foreshadowings from the Old Testament, I think, take us to the idea of our study this morning concerning the, the responsibility that Christ has over the angels of God. Now, our reading this morning, which was in the book of Hebrews, we might just start there. It was our opening reading for the devotions. In the book of Hebrews chapter 1, here's an appropriate thought to begin our consideration of this subject this morning. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, having considered the the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ as being the express image of the person of the Father, the exact representation of his Father, having sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, verse 3, Paul goes on to say this in Hebrews chapter 1, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Do you know, brothers and sisters, I think what we're being told in the book of Hebrews in chapter 1, is that Christ has always been above the angels in status. Now, now you know what I mean by that. We know in another place it says he was made a little lower than the angels. Well, that's with regard to his nature, wasn't it? But in status, he's always been higher than the angels. For this reason, brothers and sisters, as verse 5 says, unto which of the angels said God at any time, thou art my son, his real, actual, literal son. Every angel is a son of God, brothers and sisters but there's no son like this one, is there? The only begotten son of God, under which of the angels said he at any time this, says the apostle. And so now that our Lord shares the immortality that the angels already possessed before him, it's completely logical, is it not, that he will rank above them in influence. If from the moment of his birth he carried a status higher than they, albeit of lesser nature at the time, how much greater would he be now? And he is indeed, we believe, the sovereign commander of the angels. Well, let's just look at one or two references, shall we, with regard to the the building up of that idea. Christ's command of the angels in this present dispensation. If you come to the Gospel of John in chapter 3, it says this, just four passages here that we might adduce concerning the present command that the Lord Jesus Christ has over the angelic hosts of his Father. John chapter 3, and says, uh, says the text in, in verse 34, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, it says, and hath given all things unto him. So just stop and think about that passage in John. The Father loves the Son and has given given all things 
Well, in fact, into his hand, it says, into his hand, into his care, into his charge, into his responsibility. Question is, does the word all things in John 3.35 include the angels? Well, come and have a look at Ephesians chapter 1. Because in Ephesians 1, and that marvellous summation that the Apostle Paul gives about what our, what, what our loving Heavenly Father has wrought both for the Son and for the community that followed Him, the Apostle Paul says this in verse 20 of Ephesians chapter 1. He says, maybe verse 19 for connection, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power which He wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power. Now that word power, by the way, is exousia, authority. Set him far above all authority and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Question, brothers and sisters, just stop and think about the wording of Ephesians chapter 1. If our Lord Jesus Christ has been given a name above every name, not only in this world, but in the world to come, then he must possess a name above every angel, must he not? The angels are not the Elohim of the age to come, says Hebrews. They are the Elohim of this present world. So if Christ has a name now above every name that is named even in this present age, then the name of Christ and the authority of Christ reaches above and beyond. Why, even Gabriel and Michael, even in the present dispensation. For the angels of today are not possessors or controllers of the world which is yet to come. And the Lord is already above them, says Ephesians 1, raised above all other authorities, exousias, in the providence of God. I, I think that must include the angels, don't you think, brothers and sisters? Well, can I have a look at Philippians chapter 2? Remember that passage that we know so well about the exaltation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Funny thing, isn't it, how that when you're at a Bible school, you have these little weavings, the tapestries of scriptures that seem to be threaded from one study to another. One brother refers to a study, disappears off to the teenagers, and unwittingly and unknowingly another brother enters the room and says the same thing from a different perspective out of the same Bible passage. Well, Philippians chapter 2 has already been referred to in our study this morning on the faces of the cherubim. And Philippians 2 says in verse 8, he was found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Now that's an interesting expression in Philippians, isn't it? Things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, all things bow before our Lord Jesus Christ in his present exalted state. What are the things in heaven that bow before the Son? Well, it cannot be the Father, can it be? So it can only be the angels. The angels in heaven bow the knee, even now at the exalted status of our Lord Jesus Christ who is on the right hand of his Father. So you see, I think Philippians is indicating to us that the Lord indeed has become sovereign commander of the angels even in this present age. And one more passage which is really the, the clincher is the first of Peter chapter 3. We looked at it yesterday, but we perhaps didn't focus on it for this particular reason. But let's just revisit it now in the first of Peter chapter 3 and verse 22. The very last verse of first of Peter 3 says, 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he has gone into heaven. He's on the right hand of God. Angels, angels and exousias, authorities and powers, being made subject unto him, says the first of Peter chapter 3. Angels being made subject unto him. I don't think that's future, brothers and sisters. I think that's present. The Lord that always had a status above them, now clothed with immortality and seated at the right hand of the Father, is already in sovereign control of the angels. I think that's the testimony of these passages, which of course really opens our thinking up as to how things might work in the present dispensation. Now, clearly if these passages are teaching us that the angels are subject to Christ even now, just to keep it in perspective, let's remember that that's a power, brothers and sisters, that's delegated to him, a power delegated to him by God. It's only delegated authority that the Son has, isn't it? It doesn't take away or detract from the greatness of the Father. Rather, it shows the Father's confidence and love in the Son that he has been prepared to delegate to the Son this responsibility, this charge now for angelic control. But it's a power that our Lord holds from his Father. Come back to the Gospel of Matthew just for a moment in chapter 8. Do you remember, quite an interesting reference really, the story of the centurion in Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 8. And I think it's pertinent to our understanding of the Lord's authority over the angels at this particular point of time. There's just a little subtlety, you see, concerning the parable of the, well, not the parable, but the interchange of our Lord Jesus Christ and the centurion of this chapter. The record says in in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man, uh, Luke's gospel says, I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. Of course, you notice the subtlety of the expression in verse 9. The centurion never said, I am a man of authority. He said, I'm a man under authority. Did you notice that? A man under authority. And the point of the centurion's comment was that his ability to command the soldiers under him rested on the basis of that authority vested in him, but delegated from Caesar, which was above him. I am a man under authority. And because of that delegated power, brothers and sisters, the centurion was able to command his servants from Caesar to the centurion to the servants. And of course, why that's interesting is that that this is the gospel of the king. This is the face of the lion. This is the gospel of the sovereign, Matthew's gospel. And you see, concerning our Lord Jesus Christ, the Caesar is going to be representative of God, the centurion of Christ, and the servants of the angels. And the same delegated principle of authority will apply to the Son, you see, who commands his servants, the angels. But under the principle of delegation from his Father, there's no detraction from the greatness of God in this thing, brothers and sisters. And one of the interesting things, which we won't look at today because we don't have time to refer to, but one of the interesting things about the Gospel of Matthew is that this impending command of the angels is uniquely anticipated in this Gospel of all Gospels. Matthew 18, the parable of the, uh, of the reapers going into the harvest. It says that the king, the son of man, shall send forth his angels that they might gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. His angels, says Matthew 13, verse 39. Matthew 16, verse 27, when the son of man shall come with his angels. Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 25, his angels, the holy angels with the king. And lastly, Don't you know, says the Lord, uniquely in Matthew, that if I wanted to, even now, 
legions of angels would be sent at my bidding? If the Lord could say that in his mortal life, what could he say now of the angels that come under his command, brothers and sisters, under an authority that is delegated from his Father. And so the reason why this hierarchy exists now is because, and I think there's a reason for it, you see, is that because since the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ to the right hand of God, from that moment, there has been a dramatic change in the modus operandi of God. Shall I say that again? Since the moment of the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ to the heavens, there has been a dramatic change in the modus operandi of God. Now let me show you this by means of another four passages. And I think that what these passages tell us is that what was once reserved in the sole control of the Father has now clearly been delegated to the Son of His love. Now, let's start with Mark chapter 13. Now, Mark chapter 13 is the record, or Mark's record, of the Olivet Prophecy. And I just want to draw your attention to one passage in particular. In Mark chapter 13, it says in verse 32, at the end of the Lord's revelation of the Olivet Prophecy. He obviously knew a lot. He knew about the coming of the Roman power. He knew about the desolation of the temple and the land and the people. But on this particular matter, even the Lord says this in Mark 13, verse 32, but of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, Neither the Son, he says, but the Father. Did you notice that? Not even the Son. Not the angels, and neither the Son. And the Revised Standard Version says, for that last phrase, it says, but the Father only. And the New American Standard Bible says, but the Father alone. So even though the Lord had been granted knowledge of impending events that would unfold in the calamities of AD 70, even he did not know the precise timing of the event as to when it would occur. It resided at this stage in the sovereign control of the Father alone. Even this is the confession of the Son of God, brothers and sisters, that he did not know at that time, you see. He didn't know. Now come to Acts chapter 1, verse 7. Now, do you remember in Acts 1, after his resurrection, and this is interesting because the Lord is raised, but not yet ascended to the Father in the fullness of the greatness that he was to receive. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, when the apostles asked him in verse 6, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? The Lord said this in Acts 1, verse 7, he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own exousia, authority. That authority, he says, belongs to the Father. He's put it in his own private authority. The 20th century New Testament translation says he, he's reserved these for his own decision. So even the resurrected Christ, prior to his ascension, did not know all the circumstances of the times and seasons of the Father's divine timetable. It's still reserved in the control of the Father, he says. But I believe that Christ knew that he was going to be given the gift of greater insight from his Father once he ascended. In John chapter 5, we're told this, even in the days of his earthly ministry, that the Lord said to those who criticized him when he talked about his relationship with the Father and how he worked so closely with the Father, he said this in John 5 and verse 30. I think there was an anticipation, you see, John 5, verse, sorry, verse 20 says, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, 
And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. And I think implicit, you see, in the language of John chapter 5 and verse 20 was not only that the son was already blessed with revelations from his father, but that there was more to come. The father loves the son. He shows him all things. And there's more to come, says the son. I know that I'm going to receive more. Shows him, he, will, he will show him greater things than these. But I think that awaited the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ before all that would be vouchsafed unto him. And once the Lord was at the right hand of the Father, then that information would be given to the Son in its fullness. As Almighty God delegated to the Son the power and responsibility of, of guiding the angels in the matters of providence. Well, that brings us to our last passage, you see, which is Revelation chapter 1. Because do you remember what Revelation 1 said? We looked at it last night in the matter of the comforter, didn't we? It says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So now the son knows, you see. Now the son understands. Now the son's got the details. Now the son has been given the information of the timetable of God, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God now has given him. And how did he send it? He sent it and signified it by an angel. Under whose bidding does that angel act in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, brothers and sisters? But under the direct bidding of the Son of God, So you see, from the time of Mark 13, when he said the son doesn't know all the details, to the time of Revelation chapter 1, when now it has been given unto him, there's been a dramatic change. The Lord has now ascended. And I believe that what these passages are telling us is that the secrets of the divine timetable were given to Christ once he had ascended into the heavens. And if we were to ask how and why and when did this happen, I think we know exactly, brothers and sisters. Come have a look, Revelation chapter 5. I think we're, we're given a prophecy, you see, in the, in the, in the apocalypse that, that perhaps depicts the exact moment of time when this dramatic and remarkable circumstance occurred. Do you notice in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1 it says this, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the back side, written on both sides, as if there were two parts to this book, suggesting two parts to the apocalypse. And it was sealed so tightly, so completely, so utterly it was sealed. Why, says the revelator, with seven seals? Which is really Acts 1 verse 7, isn't it? The Father has reserved all these things in his own authority, said Christ sealed up with seven seals. No one can penetrate the mysteries of the timetable. And yet verse 2 says, I, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, oh, was that a Bible echo? Philippians chapter 2. No man in heaven, the angels, nor in earth, the living saints, neither under the earth, the dead saints, none of them were able to open the book or look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book. And one of the elders said unto me, verse 5, Weep not, because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And the lamb slain, who takes the book and opens the seals and makes the contents of the book understandable, is our Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? Now, let me show you a marvelous section out of 
Brother Robert Roberts's work on the, on the apocalypse entitled The Thirteen Lectures. This is what Robert Roberts says about, about this matter. Christ, the opener of the sealed scroll. Robert Roberts says, The Father, greater than all, had reserved a knowledge of the times and seasons. That's Acts chapter 1, isn't it? And their events filling the interval between Christ's departure and Christ's returning. It was sealed up as Isaiah 29 talks about a sealed scroll. The sealed scroll in the right hand was a perfect symbol of the fact that the knowledge and control of the future was entirely in the power of the Father. Notice these words up to the moment that both were imparted to Jesus. Did you notice that? The knowledge and control of the future were both imparted to Jesus. That's the significance, says Robert Roberts, of the Lamb coming to take the book and open the seals, that both the knowledge of the future and the control of the future were now given from the Father into the hands of his well-beloved Son, whom, by the way, he trusts implicitly to fulfill everything according to the will of the Father, which the Son knows perfectly and well. So Robert Roberts goes on to say this, the opening of the seals may be taken as the attainment by the opener of the knowledge of the divine purpose and the development of the events following as his carrying that knowledge into effect in causing the events to transpire. Thirteen lectures on the Apocalypse, page 34 and 35. My screen is obviously a tad smaller than that one there. So this is what Brother Robert says in terms of the significance of the vision of Revelation chapter 5. It's all been given into the hands of the Son, brothers and sisters. He opened the book. He knows. And not only does he know, but the Father said, and now, my dear Son, I give into your hand the angels so that the events of the book may now be outworked in their due and proper time under your hand. I trust you. I trust you to do this, says the Father to the Son. And by the way, as we shall see by and by in a later study, I think there was a very good reason why the Father did all of this and gave this amazing responsibility to the Son after his ascension. And so if Christ is responsible for the execution of the divine purpose right now, today, then the angels must be under his control, must they not? for the fulfillment of God's plan. Come on, have a look at Matthew chapter 28. Of course, you know this phrase, but let's just go and savor it again. Matthew chapter 28. It says, does it not, at the end of Matthew's gospel, and this by the Lord, who has not yet risen, or sorry, risen, but not yet ascended. It says in Matthew 28, verse 16, the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all exousia, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Think about that. All authority in both heaven and earth is given unto me. It reminds me of that marvelous phrase when Joseph came out of the prison house to Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 41. Do you remember what the king said, what Pharaoh said? He said, only in the matter of the throne will you be less than me. And he gave to Joseph the responsibility for the governance of all things, but not to supersede him in the final authority of the throne. The son can never supersede the father, can he? The Father is always supreme, omnipotent, in a way that even the Son himself is not. The Son is subordinate to the Father at all times, and yet he says in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. The only authority in heaven that could possibly be under the control and jurisdiction of the Son are the angelic hosts, who once did the bidding of the Father and 
who still do the bidding of the Father, but at the command of the Father's Son, who knows his Father's will. I think, you know, perhaps a helpful way of understanding this, perhaps even of envisaging it, of picturing it in our minds, brothers and sisters, is to sense that Christ is not just guiding the angels to control the nations, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father when the angels of the saints come and report to the throne. This is not not just about the greatness of global affairs. It's about the intimacy of the life of the saints as well. So let me give you again four passages that I think are, are helpful in this regard. And can I suggest that the idea here to think about is that in the present dispensation, the Son has come into the throne room of the Father. If you could imagine a throne room, brothers and sisters, and in that room is the the great throne of the almighty deity himself, but that now, seated alongside him in his right hand, in the throne room, where the angels come and go to present their reports, in that throne room is now the Son, seated alongside the Father, but in the same room. Now, come and have a look at these four passages and, again, see how they build an idea here. I think it's very helpful. Matthew chapter 18 and verse, verse 10. The Father and the Son in the throne room together. Well, this is what it says. Verse 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, says the Lord, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels, and that's one of the passages that we would adduce, would we not, brothers and sisters, to suggest that individual saints perhaps do have individual angels, these little ones, their angels, do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. And so it's always been. The angels, I believe, come and go, as it were, in presenting their reports to the Father in the throne room. But the difference now between when the Lord said that in Matthew 18 and today is that now the Son is in the throne room with the Father when those angels come. So although they come to make their report, as it were, to the throne of God, the Son hears as well as the Father. The Son sees. The Son communicates because he's in the throne room with his Father at the same time, brothers and sisters. So I think that's a helpful idea. Revelation chapter 3, which we won't turn up, says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Well, obviously, they're not on the same seat, as it were. They're sitting side by side, perhaps on two thrones. But I think the critical idea of Revelation chapter 3 is that they're in the throne room together. I think it's a very helpful way to envisage this in terms of where our Lord is. It's not as if he's acting in isolation from the Father. He's right there with the Father when the angels come. Have a look at Hebrews chapter 1 again. In Hebrews chapter 1, again, this is one of the points of difference that the Apostle Paul makes between the Son and the angels. He says this, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse, uh, maybe verse, um, verse 13. Hebrews 1 verses 13 and 14 say, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand. And and, and you've got to read verse 14 carefully. Are they, the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth? So you see the contrast. The Son, verse 13 sits in the throne room with the Father. The angels, verse 14, are sent forth to do the bidding of the throne room. They stand that they might run in the performance of the commands that they receive. The Son doesn't stand. He sits. He sits with the Father in the throne room. See, that's a tremendous difference between Christ and the angels. See, it's the same in verse 7. Of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits, His ministers a flame of fire, but unto the Son, he says, thy throne. You see, the angels are running to do the bidding as servants, but the Son sits upon a throne with responsibility to give those commands, to send forth those orders. 
And so Hebrews tells us that there is this tremendous difference between the Son and the angels. The Son sits in the throne room with the Father, and the angels are sent forth to do the bidding of that place. But at the command of the Son, who no doubt discusses all things with the Father. Now, why that's interesting is because, just come now and look at this last passage. In the first of Timothy, there's a a very interesting phrase in the first of Timothy chapter 5, which, again, I think is helpful in this context, especially if you're discussing perhaps matters with Trinitarians, and they've got a bit tangled up with Matthew chapter 28, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and because merely three things are brought together in the one verse, there is a a claim of Trinity, which of course is no proof at all, as far as Matthew 28 is concerned. Well, here's another Trinity, but what an interesting one it is. First of Timothy chapter 5, verse 21 says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. Ah, now that's an interesting threesome that are brought together in this context, isn't it? I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. Because you see, it's these parties, as it were, that transact with one another in the throne room of God. They're in contact with each other all the time. So there's constant discussion and there's constant conversation between the angels and the Father and the Son. So I think that part of the the, the wonder of what's going on, you see, in this present order of things is, is this exalted status that our Lord Jesus Christ has, even now, that empowers him to send forth the angels on various missions for the execution of the timetable of the scroll of the book of Revelation until all things be consumed. The Son, Son's in charge, but only under the principle of delegated authority from his Father, And given that they sit in the throne room together, there is absolute unity between the two as the Son seeks to execute his Father's own purpose in the earth. And that leads us to our last thought for this morning in terms of what that might mean, you see. What does that mean for us today? Well, what it means, I think, is this, that the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, is in control of the providential responses of the angels that come to our assistance in times of needs. The Lord's in control of this, together with his Father. And I think that the apostles were acutely aware of this. So let's just look at a few passages, shall we, by way of conclusion, just to summarize our thinking in that regard. In the first of Corinthians, in chapter 16, the apostle Paul says that he had an intention to come to those to whom he was writing if the possibility existed. But the way that he describes that is this, in the first of Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 10. Sorry, verse 7. He says, For I will, I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit Now, do you know, it's not clear in that passage as to whether the Lord is God or whether the Lord is Christ. My personal view is that the Lord of the 1st of Corinthians chapter 16 verse 7 was in fact Christ. And that when Paul says, well, I'll come if the Lord permits, that what he really meant was it depends on whether Christ permits this or not. Depends on whether the Son authorizes this in my journey, in the work of the truth or not. He felt that he was under the the guidance of the Son. Now, remember as we say this, brothers and sisters, that's not at the expense of the Father. It's not instead of the Father. It's not in place of the Father because the Son is only performing the Father's purpose. It's still the Father's work that's being outworked, the Father's will. But I think that the Apostle Paul was conscious that only if the Lord permitted, the Lord that he served, the Lord Jesus Christ, might this little journey be possible? And why I think that's the case is because of these next two references in the same chapter, in the second chapter of Philippians. Because in Philippians it says this. Now Philippians chapter 2, he says this. 
verse 19 and verse 24. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. Trust in the Lord Jesus. It's not God. I trust in the Lord Jesus to do this. And again, verse 24, But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. And so you see that I trust in the Lord, Philippians 2, is I think so similar to the first of Corinthians, I trust to tarry if the Lord permit. I think it was Christ's permission that he was seeking on the matter of this journey. I trust in the Lord. See, the Apostle Paul believed himself to be under the providential control of of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is entirely reasonable if the, if, the, if the Son controls the angels. Well, of course that was possible. And especially if the Parakletos angel, in particular, the very angel of Christ is sent forth at Christ's bidding to comfort and to encourage the, the disciples and the apostles on their journey. On more than one occasion, the Apostle Paul was conscious that that Parakletos angel stood beside him, no doubt sent to him in time of need by the Son. Gabriel, says the Son, go to Paul now. Breathe encouragement into his ear now, he says. And at the command of the Son, the angel would be sent forth. I trust in the Lord that I may be able to do that, this says the Apostle Paul. So he believed this. Now, come and have a look at these two passages. These are very interesting and very helpful passages in the first and second of Thessalonians. And I just want you to notice something about how the Apostle Paul writes, because again, I think this is a beautiful way of, of understanding the tremendously close relationship that the Father and the Son share together in this matter of providential outworking. In the first of Thessalonians chapter 3 and verses 11 and 12, the apostle writes this way. Just notice carefully what he says. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one towards another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. So the Lord of verse 12 is Christ. It's the same Lord as the Lord Jesus of verse 11. So what does Paul say? He says, I believe, I hope, I pray that God and the Lord Jesus Christ might direct my way. He's under their joint providential control. Do you notice that? The Lord and his Father, may they both direct my way. Now come to the second of Thessalonians and chapter chapter 2 and see what he says at the end of that chapter. And you need to spot just a, a, little, a little interesting thought here again. In the second of Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 16 and 17 he says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God even our Father which hath loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Oh, did you notice what happens between those two epistles, brothers and sisters? See what it says? See, look at the first one. God himself and our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the second epistle it becomes our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God. He's reversed the two. He's absolutely reversed the two. In the first epistle, it's God himself and the Lord. In the second epistle, it's the Lord himself and God. May he direct our paths and establish you. Or as the second, as the third chapter goes on to say, verse 5, the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. You see, he believed that he was under the providential control of both the Father and the Son but that so intimately connected is the Father and the Son, so entwined in oneness of thought are these two in the throne room, that the Apostle Paul can interchange those two names and the order of them and know that he's still talking about the providential outworking in his life that would guide him in all things. It didn't matter whether he said God and Christ or Christ and God. It amounted to the direction of the throne room all the same. Did it not, brothers and sisters? 
the guidance of the throne room where both the Father and the Son are. And so, as we saw last night, and a reference to the, uh, to the angel in the second of Timothy chapter 4, he says, The Lord shall deliver me from all work and every evil work and preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, and, and so he shall. In fact, just have a look at that, shall we? Just, we'll conclude with this reference. In the second of Timothy chapter 4, he says this, after that marvelous testimony that he gave before Caesar in Rome, he says, verse 18, the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. And, and he goes on to say at the end of, of this chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 22, the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you all. Amen. You know, so much of good Bible study is based on good Bible reading. And good Bible reading is so largely dependent on careful reading of the words and getting the emphasis right. See, I don't think that the last verse should be read, the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. I don't think it should be read that way. I think that what he's, what he's saying is this. Do you know where that comes from, by the way? The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. You see, that's Paul quoting the closing prayer of Stephen, is it not? Acts chapter 7, verse 59 Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And, and Paul never forgot that. He made that his own spirit, as it were. And now that he's about to offer his own spirit to Christ in complete surrender at the end of his life, his prayer for Timothy was this. Now read the verse again. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit, says the apostle, meaning that he wants Timothy to experience what he also had experienced in terms of his intimacy with the Son, that the same close relationship with Christ that Paul had had, may you, Timothy, share this as well in your life, thy spirit as mine, he's saying at the end of this last epistle that he shall write. All the apostle's life, he knew that he was under the governance of the Father and the Son in the throne room from whence the angels are sent forth. A, a, a hymn, brothers and sisters, puts it this way. Lo, he tasted death for all men. He of all mankind, the head, Sinless one among the sinful, prince of life among the dead. So he wrought the full redemption and the captor captive led. Now on high, yet ever with us, from his father's throne, the son rules and guides the saints he ransomed till the appointed work be done, till he see renewed and perfect all things gathered into one.